Um, yes. So um, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to come. Um, I'm very honoured to be here. Um, and after 30 years, also a little surprised. Um, um, in deciding what I thought I should do tonight, um, I, I kind of assumed that the, the, the worst idea would be to do a, a sort of a kind of a, a, a lamentable, anguished slideshow of past work, in which case I'd try and knit together some semblance of memory and kind of like hackneyed hack anecdotes to somehow suture 30 years of artworks together and impress you and wow you with a, a kind of a, a kind of a backward looking confessional of works and um, you know uh, you know and I kind of realize against the usual artist overview the usual linear slideshow with a cringing narrative of apologies and the whole time. I like hunching over. Okay. But I can, I can, I can, yeah. And now you've, right, I was just right in my stride, but you know, whatever, I will start again. No, no, so, um, no, no, no. So, uh, you know, so this idea of sort of thinking, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? Why am I supposed to account for this stuff? 30 years of it, which, you know, a percentage of it I won't even recognize, given that I'm 53 and dementia's kind of setting in. Um, so, you know, and also the other thing is, is that given the presence of Parveen Adams, the idea of sort of somehow kind of bearing my soul to you in terms of some first order explanation of the work would, would kind of somehow lead towards some, you know, confessional, you know, you, you, she might misconstrue this as, misconstrue it as some kind of confessional apology, in which case I'd find myself in much deeper shit than, um, than normal, you know, because we know what she's capable of. Um, <laughs> You know, in a nice way. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I have to say that I, you know, uh, knowing that I was coming here and my kind of excitement about being here at this place is one thing, but my excitement is, is really embodied by the fact that I will at some point be sitting there with Parveen discussing my work, which is, so this is the kind of preamble you know, the, the, the apparent 25 or 30 minutes that I'm supposed to kind of some, give some kind of account for what I've been doing for 30 years, which even as I'm looking at these things, it seems, yeah, um, you know, that's, that's going to be tricky. Um, so, I'm, you know, I, I'm providing you with some images which are, you know, that you can look at that might be relatively entertaining, give, given the fact that we're moving from the age of entertainment into the age of light entertainment. So this should be, you know, you should gaze at these things lovingly, you know, before we get on to the kind of psychoanalytic vivisection that's to come. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, and I'm really, I'm, I'm, the, the problem is I can't guarantee any kind of real sort of, you know, entertainment for you here, nor any kind of um, tormented romantic sense of sort of, you know, kind of existential angst, in which case you might feel sorry for me. There's none of that. Um, so what I'm going to do is, on the one hand, provide pictures which you can look at and be slightly mesmerized by in a kind of sort of slightly, you know, disinterested way. And then I can, I'm going to re read from my new novel, actually, which could sound like it could be exciting, but it's really not. Uh, it's the first public airing of this thing, so there's no guarantee that it's going to be pleasant for you to hear or pleasant for me to read. Right? But in terms of... <laughs> I can't see through these glasses, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, again, you know, so... Um, I, I, what I'd like to do is I would like to kind of somehow compress the 25 or 30 minutes to kind of maybe 10 minutes, just based upon a consolidation of your boredom and my reluctance to keep reading against the groans and sighs which I anticipate will happen, to then somehow get to the point at which me and Parveen will sit there and sh then we'll have a conversation. That's, that's the point of me being here. My, my monologue is kind of just a monologue. It's a kind of an apologetic kind of preamble, a kind of a piece of autobiographical chaos, but without anecdotes because I have quite cleverly avoided talking about myself. So this is my new novel. It's called American Psycho. Uh, revised by Brittany Easton Ellis. And you have to apologize. It's very new to me too, so you have to apologize for my, you know, I might get tongue tied. Um, so anyway, yeah, American Psycho revised by Brittany Easton Ellis 
and the uh, the kind of first tech, the first kind of quote is the psychotic lapses back into nature, and that's Adorno. Um, so the wellness is next to godliness, is scrawled in washed out rainbow lettering on the side of the chemical bank near the corner of 11th and 1st and is large enough to be seen from the back seat of the cab as it lurches forward in the traffic leaving Wall Street and just as Timothea Price notices the words of, of a bus pull up, the advertisement for Le Miserable on the side blocking her view, but Price, who is with client Earth and 26, politely requests the driver to turn the radio down, a smouldering female acoustic version of Walk on the Wild Side on WFUV, and the driver, white, American, moonlighting on Uber to fund some harebrained startup, utilising the intimacy of his Prius as a network interface, does so. I'm mindful, Price is saying, I'm creative, I'm young, principled, compassionate, thoughtful. In essence, what I'm saying is that society cannot afford to lose an influ influencer like me, I'm relevant. Price calms down, continues to stare out the cab's window, probably at the word love, sprayed in red graffiti on the side of a planet organic on 7th and 4th. I mean, the fact remains that sadly not everyone cares about the planet, and that's why what we do is so important. I love my job, you love yours. But where do we go from here? Back to Los Angeles because it's cleaner? It's not really an option. I didn't transfer from UCLA to Stanford to put up with this indifference. I mean, am I alone in thinking we're actually changing the world here? Like in a movie. Another bus appears, another poster for Le Miserable replaces the word, not the same bus, because someone has written the word occupy over Eponine's face. Timothea blurts out, we have a commune set up here, I advise on radical environmental policy regulations for climate change, we're establishing a drop-in hub for the, in the Hamptons for Christ's sakes. Vicarious traumatization, blame, compassion, compassion fatigue, I say. Oh, would you mind turning that, that down a little, she says, but distractedly to the driver, and all the women of colour go, do, 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 still billowing from the radio. Sure, I can do that for you, maybe, the driver says. Timothy thanks him and continues, I could stay living in this city if they just installed aromatherapy grouch, convention, grouch prevention sprays in the cabs. Maybe the witch hazel or, 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 or lavender. Her voice softens even more here. Either or, I don't mind. She unplugs her apple earbuds, verging on complaint. I hate to complain. I really do about the trash, the unrecycled garbage, the poverty and disease, about how toxic this city is. And you know, and I know that it's a sty. She continues talking as she opens her new Maharishi rollaway backpack she got from the official Maharishi website. She places the buds in their case alongside her humble 5S with its shattered screen. She had an iPhone X but returned it because it was weird she, because she was weirded out by facial recognition and retrieves a copy of today's free news, news, newspaper shoved in the footwell. In one issue in one issue she says, let's see here estrogen compound synthesizers detected in drinking water airborne pollution at an all time high at men going their own way celibacy rally, weird genetic mutations the alt right. She flips through the pages excitedly. Baseball players suffer HIV denial too many electric cars and not enough hookups, gridlock, the homeless, various domestic terrorists, asthmatics dropping like flies in the streets, regretful surrogate mothers, the tragic real-life death of an actor killed off in the script of a popular soap opera, immigrants who broke into a zoo to eat various animals alive, the big question, mass extinction or eco-fascism. And the joke is, the punchline is, it's not just in this city, it's everywhere, it sucks. Wait, more Alt-right, gridlock, gridlock, baby sellers, black market babies, HIV babies, baby junkers, Sackler Gallery collapses on baby, maniac baby, gridlock, opiate art museum collapses. Her voice stops. She takes in a breath and then says, her slightly crazed eyes, eyes fixed on a beggar at the corner of second and fifth. That's the 24th one I've seen today. I've kept count. Then she asks without looking over, why aren't you wearing your cute army surplus shirt with those grey pants? I shrug. Price tells me she's wearing a Maharishi upcycled M51 kimono rib jacket, a Maharishi White Eagle Tour silk jumpsuit, and Maharishi Nike Air Max. 
There's a moderately interesting story on, in, in the post concerning two people who disappeared at a party aboard a Greenpeace yacht while the boat was circling the island. A residue of spattered blood and three smashed veggie wear champagne glasses are the only clues. Foul play is suspected and police think that perhaps a machete was the killer's weapon because of certain grooves and, whoop, and indentations found on the deck. No bodies have been found. There are no suspects. Price began her monologue today over, over lunch and then brought it up. Her monologue, not her lunch. Again, during Pilates and continue, continued ranting over drinks at Harriet's where she'd gone on over vodka and lime much more interest, interestingly about the Fisher debacle that Paula Owen is handling which concerns the illegal disposal of hormone disrupting chemicals. Price will not calm down. Diseases she exclaims, her face tenses with pain. There's this insane theory going around that if you can catch meningitis from a vaccination then, then having sex with someone who is, who is vaccinated means you can catch anything, whether it's a virus per se, Alzheimer's, muscular dystrophy, haemophilia, leukemia, anorexia, diabetes, cancer, multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis, cerebral palsy, dyslexia for Christ's sakes. They're saying you can get dyslexia from a penis. I'm not sure, but I don't think dyslexia is a virus, I say. Oh, I know that. They know that. It's a popular scare tactic. Outside this cab on the sidewalks, pigeons peck at pieces of diced tofu in front of what used to be Gray's papaya, while a trans parade and its chaperone police car cruise the wrong way down a one-way street and the sky is immense and blue and in an uber that stopped in traffic across from this one a woman who looks a lot like louisa caruthers waves over at timothy and when timothy doesn't return the wave the woman straight brunette hair with a short french plaque cool geek glasses realizes it's not who she thought it was and looks back at her own discarded copy of usa today panning down to the sidewalk there's an old homeless bag man holding a bunting flag and he waves it at the pigeons who ignore it as they continue to take turns to peck at the remains of the tofu and the police car disappears into an automated car wash but then when you just come to the point when you re your reaction to the times is one of total and sheer acceptance when your body has become somehow tuned into the insanity and you reach that point where it all makes sense when it clicks we get some poor homeless nonsuch who's making a stand and actually wants listen to me patricia wants to be out on the streets this those streets see those she points and we have a mayor who won't listen to him a mayor who won't let this poor soul exert his rights. Holy Christ, let the poor soul, poor soul stay on the street if he wants. Let him be. Let him live outside this mad, ma man-made goddamn misery. And look, you're back where you started. Contradicted. Fucked. Number 24. No, 25. Who's going to be at Evelyn's? Wait, let me guess. She holds up a hand attached to worried, close-bitten fingernails. Ashley, Courtney, Maldwin, Martin, Charles. Am I right so far? Maybe one of Evelyn's banker friends from Oh My God, the East Village. You know the type, the ones who make compensation to the planet by asking Evelyn if she has a nice, free, dr free, free-range dry Chardonnay. She puts her hand over her forehead and shuts her eyes and now she mutters, jaw clenched, I'm leaving, I'm dumping Meredith, he's essentially daring me to like him, I'm gone, why did it take me so long to realise that he has all the personality of a goddamn shame game show host? 26, 27, I mean, I tell him I'm hypersensitive, I told him I was still freaked out by, by Fukushima, I can feel the radiation in my bones, I can feel their pain, their loss, what more does he want? I'm ethical, act I mean, I'm determined to make a difference. I'm optimistic about the future, about tackling mass extinction. I mean, aren't you? I say, sure. Every mushroom cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> And all I get is shit from him. 28, 29, holy shit, it's a goddamn city of the damned, I tell you. She stops suddenly as if exhausted by the burden of compassion and turning away from, an, from another advertisement, remembering something important, says, did you read about the priest from that Catholic school? He raped two teenage boys, depraved pig, pig. Shocking, really shocking. Price waits for a reaction. There's none. Suddenly, Upper West Side. It's cold for April. And Price walks briskly down the street towards Evelyn's brownstone, whistling no woman, no cry. The heat from her mouth creating smoky white dreadlock plumes of steam and swinging her Maharishi rollaway backpack. A figure with straight brunette hair, a short French plait and cool geek glasses approaches in the distance wearing a Maharishi Washitushi geisha print cotton gabardine shirt with Maharishi Maha cropped wide leg joggers, a Maharishi Suikoki Kuno three-toed tabby sandal and carrying the exact same Maharishi rollaway backpack that Price has and Timothy wonders aloud 
Is it Victoria Powell? It can't be. The woman passes under the LED, LED glare of a steep street lamp with a troubled look on her face that momentarily curls her lips into a slight smile and she glances at Price almost as if they were acquainted, but just as quickly she realises that she doesn't know Price and just as quickly Price realises it's not Victoria Powell and the woman moves on. Thank God, Price mutters as she, hears, as she nears Evelyn's. It looked a lot like her. Hang on, I'm going to move a little bit because I'm bored. I move out the kitchen into the communal space where a table has just been casually set, an array of mandarin goji candles from scent lit on small dishes. Nothing about Stash is Maharishi, nor Vanden, but he has a cute green streaks, he has a cute green streak in his hair. He stares at an ABBA promo from the last century playing on TV whilst vaping. Ahem, I cough. Vanden looks over warily, probably drugged to the eyeballs. Stash doesn't move. Hi Patricia Bateman, I say. I'm Patricia Patricia Bateman, I say. Sorry. Waving, noticing my reflection in a mirror hung on the wall and smiling at how radiant I appear, she waves back limply. Stash pretends to inspect her fingernails. Just get them out of here, Price is seething. They're both wasted and I want to watch the goddamn blue planet. Evelyn is still opening large bottles of artisan beer and absently afflicted by some residue of the days before plant-based sushi, saying, we've got to eat this stuff soon or else we're all going to be poisoned. He's got a cute green streak in his hair, I tell him, but this vape isn't even CBD. Bateman, Timothy says, still glaring at even. Yes, I say to Timothy, you're being problematic. Oh, Patricia. Evelyn says, but she's the girl next door. That's Patricia. You're not problematic, are you, honey? Evelyn is on Mars, and I move towards the bar to make myself another drink. Girl next door, Timothea smirks and nods and then reverses her expression and hostilely asks Evelyn again if she has a safety pin. Evelyn finishes opening the beer bottles and tells Courtney to fetch Stash and Vanden. We have to eat this now or else we're going to be poisoned, he murmurs slowly. We have to eat this now... Uh, Moving his head, take, taking in the kitchen, making sure he hasn't forgotten anything. We're all going to be poisoned anyway on account of all the toxic heavy metals in shiitake mushrooms, Courtney says before exiting. I have to talk to you, Evelyn says. What about I come up to him? No, he says, then pointing at Timothea to Price. Timothea still glares at him fiercely. I say nothing, and, Timothea's, and, Tim, and Timothea takes another drink. Be a sweetheart, be a sweetheart, he sells, tells me, and place the sushi on the table. Tempura is on the pan. I'm wondering where Evelyn got the sushi, the enoki mushrooms, the shiitake mushrooms, the pom-pom mushrooms, and even matsutake, all seem so fresh, and their piles of wasabi and clumps of ginger placed strategically around the platter, but I also like the idea that I don't know, will never know, will never ask where it came from, and that the sushi will sit there in the middle of the glass table from furnished green that Evelyn's hip father bought him like some mysterious apparition. As I set the, set the slate plater down, I catch a glimpse of my reflection on the surface of the table. My skin seems glowing because of the candlelight, and I notice how nice the little DIY trim I did looks. I make myself another drink. I still worry about the sodium level in the faux soy sauce. Four of us sit around the table waiting for Evelyn and Timothea to return from getting Price a safety pin. I sit at the head of the table taking large swallows of J&B. Vanden sits at the other side reading disinterestedly from one of Evelyn's old threadbare student books called The Revolution of Everyday Life. Stash has pushed a chopstick into a lone piece of enoki mushroom that lies on the middle of a plate like some shiny impaled insect and the chopstick stands straight up. Stash occasionally moves the piece of sushi around the plate while the chopstick, but with the chopstick but never looks up at either myself or Vanden or Courtney who sits next to me sipping sake from an old tin mug. Evelyn and Timothea come back perhaps 20 minutes after we've seated ourselves and Evelyn looks only slightly flushed. Timothea glares at me as she takes the seat next to mine, a fresh drink in hand and she leans over towards me about to say, to admit, to admit something, when suddenly Evelyn interrupts, not there Timothy, Timothea, then barely a whisper, girl, boy, 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 girl, girl, girl. He gestures towards the empty beanbag next to Vanden. Timothea shifts her, glaze, her glare to Evelyn and hesitantly, hesitantly takes the beanbag next to Vanden, who yawns and turns a page of the book. Well, everybody, even Evelyn says, smiling, pleased with the meal he has presented, dig in. And then after noticing the piece of sushi that Stash has pinned, she's now bent low over the plate, whispering at it. Evelyn's compo composure falters, but he smiles bravely and chirps, Saki, everyone? No one says anything until Courtney, who is staring at Stash's plate, lifts his mug uncertainly 
Evelyn says, trying to smile. It's delicious, Evelyn. Stash doesn't speak, even though he's probably bored at the table and can't I bet, identify with anyone else in the room. Her hair is red, voluptuous, her jet black clothes neat and fitted, her personal net worth pres presumably obscene, and not a green dollar to be counted. And this is why she can afford to lack any intrapersonal warrant and sits there as if perplexed by the piece of plant-based sushi. As, as Just as the table is about to start eating, she sits up and loudly declares, pointing an accusing finger at a plate, it fucking moved. Timothy glares at her with a contempt so total that I can't fully equal. But I muster enough energy to come close. Vanden seems amused. So now, unfortunately, does Courtney, who I'm beginning to think finds this monster attractive. But I suppose if I were dating Louisa Caruthers, I might too. Even laughs good-naturedly and says, oh, Stash, you're a riot. And even, and then worriedly, Tempura, Evelyn is an advocate for corporate sustainability, for your information. I'll have some, I tell him, and I lift a piece of eggplant off the platter, though I won't eat it because it's fried in something other than extra virgin olive oil. The, the table begins to serve themselves. Yes. Stop. Yeah, stop. yeah no, I'm happy to stop. Totally happy to stop. Should we, should we do this? <laughs> Come on. That's good. I'm happy. Is it? <laughs> See, I, did, I didn't get to any of the bits of the kind of the murder and the killing and the, uh, the, the extreme violence. <laughs> Should be fun bits. Would you like to read the whole thing? No. no. We could have a vote by the audience. Well, it's, it's just quite quite clearly what's happening is that I've rewritten it from the point of view of a woman. Did anybody get it? No. You're idiots. Your no. friend did. No, no, no. Because well, I, I told him. <laughs> Oops. Cheers, Dave. Go on, okay. I don't expect it's you are expecting me to comment on your novel. No, I, I it, was, it was a way of wasting some time. Yeah. Well, that's why I thought maybe I should stop you. I said, oh, thank God someone did. Obviously, everyone thinks I was very rude. No, I think it's uh, fine. The, these uh, images that yeah. I haven't seen before, when did you do them? These ones? Yes. Um, it's kind of a bit of a weird view from where I am. Uh, they're kind of, it's just a, it's just a random hodgepodge of, yeah, probably even the past few years, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gosh, this is the only life we can have. Yeah. Okay, I uh, won't be allowed to talk for five minutes before I ask you. Can I time you and then tell you to stop? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you I'll, tell you to, I'll tell you to stop at but four. But I can't read in this light. Can I have more light, please, somebody? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that okay? No. Is that better? For, for the back? Yes, yeah. That's good. Well, I've gone off again. Huh? Okay. Um, this is just to you. Yeah. I found myself writing a, an essay and then realized I was yeah. talking to you. Me too. <laughs> I would place your work in the field of comedy. Comedy is not laughter. Laughter deals with disfigurements of many sorts, and of course, even in recent times, the maimed, the disfigured, the mutated. Think of the human known as the elephant man, who were invited, were exhibited to invite and excite laughter. You have gestured to Victor Hugo's 1869, The Man Who Laughs, and you referenced a chapter heading which was the utilization of the unfortunate by the fortunate. His face had been chiseled, the mouth enlarged, the lips cut away, the gums laid bare, the ears distended, the cartilage cut, the eyes displaced, the cheeks enlarged, and more. The face bears a forced, an irremovable laugh. Audiences responded with laughter, laughter in the face of outrageous injury. None of that has to do with comedy, but it is raw material for you. Here is my definition of comedy, the only psychoanalytic thing <laughs> I have. The element in comedy that satisfies us that makes us appreciate it in its full human dimension, not excluding the unconscious. 
is not so much the triumph of life as its flight. The fact that life slips away, runs off, escapes all those barriers that oppose it, including precisely those that are the most essential, those that are constituted by the agency of the signifier. The phallus is the signifier of this flight. Life slips away, runs off, escapes all rules and regulations through something that is produced between the original and that original after you have worked it over, an in-between space. Something new produced through the similarities and differences between the two. It is, uh, I'm sorry, I was expecting you to have shown this audience, some of whom may not know your work, <laughs> many years, but uh, you haven't, and so. They can Google. It's <laughs> right now, yes. Sure, they can right now. I'm sure some people are. Some people are emailing, definitely. <laughs> that always happens. Uh, something new is produced through the similarities and differences between the two. It is no longer Goya's original representation, nor is it the Chapman's image. What emerges is a new Goya. You can't say that the Chapman's fathered this new Goya, and you can't say that Goya fathered the Chapman's. In the in-between, life slips away, escapes. So this might seem odd, because your work seems more, much more about death than life, but I think it is about life, so that's just, mm -hmm. that is just my, my comment. What I wanted to ask you was, um, the, the isolated questions, uh, but great deeds against the dead, and I do wish we had a bit of it, uh, from Goya's Disasters of War, is being constant in your work. Mm. I think since your GCSE exams, weren't you working on this at the same time? I believe you were. Mm, the GCSEs were done when we were about, I was about 30. Yeah. Yeah, so we, went back, we, were, <laughs> we got bad grades the first time around, so we tried to read. <laughs> <laughs> we thought as YBAs we might better get better grades, but obviously, no, I, I actually got worse. I got <laughs> It's true. We went to a cramming college in Notting Hill. <laughs> Honestly, I know. Anyway, it's fine. Um, but what you had done was to take the the, the figures on the tree. There are yeah. three dead figures mm. on on the tree in the original, and you made a sculpture of it. Mm. A really horrific sculpture where you went much further in a sense. You. You fragmented them all, you draped them over the tree, and I think... I don't really contest that. Okay. Only, only because, yeah. actually, I kind of... Because I think the, the, the kind of... The, 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 the kind of embedded metaphysics in the prints, in terms of the grain and in terms mm -hmm. of the kind of... The, 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 the kind of ex the, the, the existential, you know, kind of density of the drawing... Um, Compared to the, the 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 sculpture, which was just even by um, enlarging the work, was already a way of actually sort of shedding the kind that kind of you know that intensity of the work. So they they were they were in it in its kind of um, in its kind of. Uh, Extension into natural, real-life scale. I mean, I think I think in a way it became kind of like a, a an, a, an awful, an awfully superfluous representation of something which had a kind of a, a kind of a, 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 a veracity and a sense of violence to it. I mean, I think it, I think and, and I think that in a sense that that what's interesting about the transition from one to the other is that is that there's a certain amount of optimism that kind of went from one to the other. Where that if you that if you that if you have this kind of drawing which is kind of this big that has this kind of focusing intensity to it that if you if you if you if you, if you engineer a version of it which is life size that, that you would presume that if you had some kind of empathy for or some compassion for the images the, for the for the subjects of this mm -hmm. image that, that you would necessarily translate it and it would become even more intensified by its becoming r real life because real life you would you would get confused for real life as being real, real life as being naturalistic, but in actual fact, the idea that actually, you know, those things became, they became actually trivial because the materiality of it, um, there was no intent to actually try and sort of sustain the kind of existential value of the work from its, from its, from its um, authentic and, incarnation. And that's what you mean by deadness, is it? Yeah, it, would, yeah. It, it, it had a kind of, a, a, um, it, you know, in, in a sense, I, I guess the reason that we are 
have been kind of re repeatedly interested in this image because it, it, if, if you were going to take this as a kind of a forensic uh, um, document of kind of humanistic pain yeah. in its most elemental form, like as if somehow you could kind of somehow pick one thing which would be a, a fossil of, of, of pathos, and then you emptied it of its pathos by producing this thing which does nothing more, nothing less other than copy it. But in terms of the idea of actually how that thing is reproduced is that the materiality of it cannot sustain, you know, it, it's, it's, it's okay, so I mean, I get the, 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 the ultimate reason that we keep, is because it's like saying, you know, the, the, the metaphysics involved in this work, or I would say superimposed over this work, because I don't think, I think that's, I think what's interesting about that work is that it undermines its own metaphysics, is our, our repeat return to the scene of this crime is not in order to kind of amplify its metaphysics, but it's to actually drain it. But, um, I, I, I've been talking. Sorry, in my head was the yeah. etchings on which you, you paint, and yeah. I think what you've just said is not quite the thing you would say about that. I imagine. Right. Uh, so this is the period yeah. when you are making the, uh, the plastic mannequins and, yes. and even casting some of them, yes. and, and the deadness is, is. Yeah, but the inertia, there. the inertia. Yeah. But you did a lot with this. I'm really quite, yeah. I mean, what what made you grip on it so much? Because you then did, well, the disasters war, you did all 89 etchings yeah. before you bought your first set, right? <laughs> before we could afford that. You then made those, each yeah. one of them, into tiny, tiny sculptures. Yes. And then you did something yeah. in your GCSE. So it, yeah. it's... And they haven't stopped, you know, but then you bought them, and then you bought yeah. two sets of them. Yeah. Uh, and I just, it, it's obviously, and it's this particular one, Great Deeds Against the Dead, that, that somehow, yeah. so I wonder where, how did it begin? Do you mean the big sculpture of the... No. No. You're interested in... Oh, in um, because I think that there's a kind of, you know, even on a very you know, hackneyed historical view of this work. The idea of saying the emergence of a kind of a, a notion of progressive modernity, which must have at some point, there's kind of some evolutionary sort of crawling from the, the sort of the primal soup in terms of like shifting from um, religious icon iconographic representation where all representation is determined by some, you know, some, some uh, you know, formal requirement to, to describe the divine, you know, for purposes of kind of, you know. And so, the, so the idea of saying that, well, <laughs> three down already, four, five. <laughs> So, so the idea, so the idea of saying that what's kind of, you know, that you could kind of lay the blame for, you know, certainly with, you know, Goya's sort of interest in enlightenment and the transition, in, in a sense, from this notion of an art which, which has a kind of a pragmatic relationship to, to iconographic representation, to an art that suddenly invents this notion of the psyche that has a, this concept of what it is to be human, which is not negotiated by some divine notion of redemption, and quite clearly, this one picture. That if you're going to look at this kind of this kind of divergence away from the representation of the body as being something kind of um, you know some, something which which has this kind of uh, transcendental accord with sort of divinity, is that suddenly you have this image where there are three people hanging on a tree, and in a sense there's a kind of a really interesting reverberation in terms of its trinity. Mm -hmm. There are three figures. The kind of the fact in which this tree is you know okay it's a kind of it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of optimistic to think that it has some cruciform element to it. But it is something to do with hanging. Yeah. It is something to do with the idea that what happens with these bodies, as opposed to all, by all other bodies represented in Christianity, is that what they suffer is they suffer the burden of physics, which, is, which means to say that these bodies drip into the soil. And there's no redemption for these, for these figures. So this is a hugely heretical image. You know, a hugely heretical image. It's kind of like, you know, the Holbein painting I of the... Elon, Elon, exactly elongated, elongated yeah. Christ and Dostoevsky says that you could lose your faith by looking at this and, yeah. and, and the brilliance of this painting of, of this kind of elongated Christ is the reason it's elongated is because it's demonstrating the effect of gravity 
and the effect of gravity on Christ's body, if you imagine the sight of that, that to work out that actually more compelling in terms of this act of, you know, crucifixion is, is not redemption, the sense in which this thing has some kind of uh, a, a, an ability to return as new. What you have is that you have this thing which is longer than it was when it was, when it was, you know, what that demonstrates is this sense in which this new form of, of religion, as he, uh, i.e. physics, which Goya was, you know, this, the idea that what well, here is this thing where what is so brutal about this image is there's no sense of, uh, of redemption in this image at all. These bodies are doomed to, to gravity and to the, and to the, and to the, uh, and to the um, you know, the, the kind of, the, 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 the simple redemption of matter. I was actually going to ask you what other paintings. That one. <laughs> well, okay, so that's yeah, yeah. the one you're stuck with. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I mean um, even like Grunewald's is is an high altar piece. It's the same thing because Christ, you know, the kind of the kind of the lepers, you know, sitting around, the, you know, as Christ is on the cross. Christ is also a leper. You know, so so the, 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 there are these kind of these interventions in terms of the sacredness of the flesh, where suddenly you see the, the, the flesh of Christ as being also plague plague ridden, which is kind of like you know how how does that kind of fit in with the notion of you know Christianity? Tell them I know what you think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Very short quotations from you first. Yes. Then a question. Uh, there is a fundamental appeal to a reality, a version of reality that offers nothing practical, nothing utilitarian, yeah. nothing conforming to human scale, yeah. nothing useful, nothing truthful. Mm -hmm. Another quote, a return to a set of ideas and a set of failed solutions over and over, as we have stated many times, like a dog returns to its vomit, mm -hmm. which is also the title you gave for the Los yeah. Yeah. We are interested. We're interested in the redemptive value of transgression, producing things with zero cultural value to produce aesthetic inertia. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in, this, in what you have to say about the repetition of failed solutions. In one sense, yeah. every artist is going to say mm, so, it hasn't got yeah. there. <laughs> but, well, otherwise, but, it'd stop. But, but this is a particular kind, yeah. kind of failure yeah. in, in your case. Yeah. Um, and here you reference two things that I found really interesting. One was Saad, mm -hmm. and the other was Rosalind Krauss writing on Sol Levit. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you just go, go stay with Saad for the first. Uh, You've said about 120 days of Sodom. While the book may be exhaustive in terms of its description of death and torture, ultimately the reading has nothing to do with that. Mm. It has to do with the individual passage of wasteful time. Mm. I, I agree, but then I have a question, I wonder if you've thought about it. Um, and it is what Saad does in his writing. Uh, how he treats the body. Mm. And you have said it at one point, you say something about you want to know how bodies become bodies. Mm. And I think this is one maybe uh, place where I'd like you to yeah. elaborate, perhaps off the cuff, perhaps you've thought about sure. it. But there is uh, a fantastic um, violence on the body. Mm -hmm. So you have an, you banished an imaginary space in Saad, mm -hmm. Every, all of their mirrors, everything is reflected, and so it's a closed space where everything is visible. Mm -hmm. And as it were, the violence of desire has already been um, displaced by something that almost sounds like a set of religious mm. instructions that Juliet gives, I mm, think, yeah. how you get rid of yes. desire. First you uh, lie down and you yeah. think about something, and yeah. say, there's a whole series of passages. Um, but the end result of this, yeah. And I agree with the wasteful time, and that's yeah. wonderful, and your repetition might be thought that, and yeah. the deadness, and you know, it all mm -hmm. fits together. But what do you, how do you think of this Sardian body? Yeah. I mean, where, I don't know how to think about it at all. I, I just would like to know if you have thoughts. Uh, um, because it's quite run, like one of the bodies yeah. you operate on. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I guess that I suppose that, you know, Thinking about Saad, you know, rather than you know the, the idea of saying that why would 120 days be interesting from the point of view of of, of um, disavowing the content 
you know, uh, which I guess is what I'm, I'm kind of suggesting that what, what's interesting about yeah. Assad is that you have this inside, encyclopedic description of transgression where transgression in itself has no intrinsic yeah. value. That what he does is, is that by kind of, by um, um, uh, exhausting the plane of description, that you end up with no, you end up, you end up where where desire itself, sexuality itself, become completely obliterated. There's no, you don't recover any sense. And and I guess the, my interest in that would be that that you know, Sard's encyclopedic description of of blasphemy of of, of violence would be an entirely um, um, perfect example of capital. <laughs> Okay. Because, because in some senses, the idea, of, you know, what Freud says is that the, the idea of kind of, um, you know, voyeurism, the idea of scopophilia, what it does is it supplants the object of sexuality with things which become desirable without the actual act. Mm -hmm. You know, so the so the repression, so the repression of the primary desires in favour of secondary yeah. returns. And I think that in some sense you could look at, at, at Sard as being this perfect example of, you know, in terms of the the, the deviation of how the notion of a natural Realistic notion of sex is completely, yeah. Yeah. is completely kind of, uh, you know, that it's intensified by the idea of saying, you know, kind of in 120, 120 days by, uh, you know, this, um, the um, Pasolini film, you know, it culminates yeah. in that thing where the person has the the the, the binoculars. And rather than wanting to see the image, they turn the, the they turn the, 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 the binoculars around so that in fact what they can't see is the image of I think it's someone being tortured at the end. So it de it demonstrates the notion of saying that you know that the idea of assuming that sexuality has some natural kind of yeah. frame of reference is not how how, I agree how with human all sexuality that. There's operates. Just, there's just an yeah. inconvenience of this, yes. or, or where what the place of this. Right. tortured bodies. I don't want to go into it, but that was, yeah. you know, it was just uh, a query. But the second thing is, um, was uh, Rosalind Krauss, and she was absolutely brilliant on, when talking about Solovit, who yeah. did a uh, very irrational but logical system thing. Yeah. There yeah. were systems. Um, and she compares it to a passage in Beckett's yeah. Malloy, where you have, yes, it's about sucking stones. Yeah. And he has four pockets, two in his jacket, two in his yeah. trousers, and there are four stones in each of the pockets. And he's going to rotate them all. Yeah. So he does this, and then he thinks, how do I know that I've rotated each of the stones? Hmm. And so there's a, a as he goes along, he makes more rules to be sure that every one of the 16 stones would have done yeah. whatever part, you know, it, yeah. it, could, it could go on. Yeah. And this is compared to Solowit's uh, yeah. work. Yeah. Um, you referred to it. Uh, I have just one thing to say about it, which is that Solowit's work and, and the stones story, they are a system which revolves with nothing inside. Mm. All right, it's round, mm. round empty space. I don't think your work is like that. Uh, and I think it. I think. Well, okay, carry on. Go on. No. 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 We'll get to you know. No. Go on. Well, okay. I mean, so you know, th th there's something kind of extremely visceral about, you know, Beckett's account of this stone circulation, sucking, pocketing, yeah. turning, returning, the confusion, confused about what the process of his own language is. And the, the, the interesting thing about Krauss applying this to Sol Lewitt is that you would see that Sol Lewitt is more within the register of something kind of like aesthetically scientific, schematic. There's a structure to it. And so, you know, the, 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 the analogy wouldn't seem to fit, really. But in terms of the relationship between Solowit and, say, a kind of an expressionistic painter, right? An ex expressionistic painter would seem to be someone who, who has a kind of a confessional attachment to the work, that the work, the representation, the way in which the work is perceived, that someone reviewing the work could actually engage with the notion that this is a language that they could. Yeah, I, I right. So, so, that, so that then you would look at the Solowit and say, well, what's a Solowit compared to a monk? You know, you'd look at Solowit and say, well, it's barren. 
It has no expressionistic value whatsoever. It has but no. I'm talking about your work, oh, and it's not well, barren, is what I'm saying. No, I mean, I, I, and so I'd, I'd like some yeah, formulation. I mean, I would say, that. I would say that, <laughs> not to be facetious, but I think our, our work is kind of. Um, in terms of, you know, if you think about the kind of the schematic procedural mannequin pieces, you know, they're in a sense that, you know, that what they do is they, they, you know, they present this notion of saying that they have this content, but in fact, all they are is they're they're, they're the combination of stone sucking and soul the wit, but with some kind of um, exaggerated libidinal content. You know, they're kind of like, I mean, I would say, I mean, I'm really hugely optimistic in claiming this, but I would say they're like solo it, Rosalind Krauss, but an overdose of Marx and, and Freud. <laughs> But um, I bet if you ask Sol Luit that, he'd be totally confused. If I think of uh, <laughs> uh, if I think of your work on, I go back. I'm sorry, constantly to the etchings. Yes. Um, and this in between that I was talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's clear that it's an it's. It, these are not the right words anymore, but in a sense it's an operation on Goya mm -hmm. that produces an end result, which is the evacuation yeah. of... Yeah. So, but it's doing something, I mean, it's yeah. doing yes. something rather than an empty, empty hole in... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In yeah. That's all I meant. Okay. Yeah. Very quickly. I, I did. I read your essay that you wrote. Oh God! I thought you might write it. Oh, you know. Well, I, this is new stuff. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> no, it's a great. It's a. It's a very okay. frightening essay. That's um, why I read that thing and didn't try. Uh, <laughs> there are two examples I want to reference uh, in, in in relation to the failed solutions. Right. Um, and I wonder if they made any difference, because they seem different in kind to your usual mm. interventions. One was uh, the Bruegel. Right. Apparently your gallery bought you a Bruegel for £22,000. <laughs> you know, we're worth it. Yeah. Oh, but it was worth more than that. No, I think it was, it was like, kind of like, it was like... Can I finish my question okay, first? <laughs> okay, you painted over it. Yeah, of course. It was a crucifixion. I was stunned. Mm. I only read this very recently, and I felt quite uncomfortable. Mm. You, you had worked on a canvas of which there was only one, mm. unlike the etchings. Mm -hmm. So I had caught myself out. Yeah. I had not relinquished the idea of sure. the original. But did it give you any slight qualms whatsoever? Oh, the misapprehension is thinking that we had, you know, that somehow the, the kind of the, the gesture of working on a, on, a, on a Goya print was kind of, uh, you know, you could com compensate that by thinking there's lots of them, lots more of them, so this gesture can be kind of, um, you know, limited, damage limitation to just one set of Goyas rather than, you know, one, mm. one Bruegel. Um, you know, I think so far we've worked on maybe eight sets of Disasters of War, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know how many Caprichos. I mean, our aim is is to is to work on all of them. <laughs> that, that's right. fine. So, no, no, so, so, no, no, but so, no, but so the misapprehension is just simply because there's one Bruegel that you what you thought yes. that we'd have any kind of qualms about working on it. No, we are, we we have a slush fund of <laughs> all the money that's paid for the to the Goyers in this kind. Of, but now we have to send these kind of sort of uh, you know kind of anonymous people into auctions and stuff to buy the Goyers for us because they're wise to it. <laughs> and also, actually, the price of Goyers has gone up. <laughs> so Goya is a better artist for us drawing on him. <laughs> and Bruegel too. No. Uh, okay. No. My second no. example. No, no, the, the serious thing about this is that is that you know the, you know the purpose of drawing on these things is is that you know you know when Duke de Kooning, you know when Rauschenberg takes Yeah, it, I thought of that, well, but it's not yeah, the same. No, it's it's not of course the same. it's not. Okay. It's kind okay. of that's kind of that's Okay. That's uh, folk so art. if you want any questions, let me just do my last thing. Um, the second example of something new was the 2017 show at mm. Lane Southern, uh, which so clearly shows the process you have of building on what was built yeah. endlessly, yeah. because you include things from the giant fun drawing book yeah. and yeah, coloring yeah. book. Yeah. Everything's, everything's in yeah. there with the Goya. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the combinations are, are breathtaking and, and very funny. Uh, but what struck me was the collage. Mm. 
that you collaged stuff with Goya mm. etchings left me speechless. Why? Could, could I have the 14 images that I just want shown one after the other, please, and we, then we stop? Is that, is that, is that because... <laughs> I mean, what's is there somebody to do this? No, he's definitely there? not going to do it. <laughs> He's doing. They were already playing with it. I think they were. Yeah. No, that's not it. They were showing it already while you were talking. Oh. No, but these are not it. So what was he showing? <laughs> Chaos. Ah, this lot. Not that lot. Oh. This yeah, lot. Part of that. Oh, but I thought you mean the collage ones. Yeah, they are. They're there. Yes, okay. they're there as well. But you can see, th this was this was building on the building on the building yep. with a vengeance. Yep. Everything from the past work yep. is in these. Yep. Um, now, can we just stop? Can we stop briefly? Yep. Uh, but this is not the one I want, so we can go on a bit further. Oh, there's a tr no, it's a tree again. And can you, can you see it? And one more? No, one more. Oh. No, one more. <laughs> oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you knew the Goya, yeah. that would really have shaken you up. And what I think is very interesting, why I bother to, to bring it up, is I don't know any collagist who does this. No. And that is because you are copying the bloody Goya again. Well, and it's, makes, it's wonderful. Well, but look, but look what, you know, the thing is, is that you've kind of draw nice things on Goya. You know, the, the, the thing is that what you can do is you can sort of, you know, they, they, they're kind of, you know, there is a, there's a kind of sort of an arrogance in terms of the fact that if you do something, you know, the, the, the idea and in, in, the, the incapacity of, say, for example, a, a commentator who will call it um, vandalism, there's something quite hilarious about the fact that, you know, that, that vandalism is a kind of an incredibly impotent um, um, uh, complaint, really, given the fact that actually there's a kind of a, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an element of artisanal skill in terms of the lovely little paintings, and so that, they, that so that what's what's demonstrated in that kind of that kind of gesture of kind of like um, you know kind of anger by saying it's vandalism is to say that well they're quite clearly not actually looking at it. So so the idea of saying that on the one hand that you could you know that you could that part of the argument for these works when the 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 the, Goya, the drawing on the goyas display some kind of um, talented drawing that it kind of it slightly mitigates the the uh, the obscenity by saying well at least they kind of did something quite nice on it you know the thing about the, the collages is what's quite funny about it is that fucking hell it's like they've just cut things out and stuck them on. I mean, have, even, have you, or is it, it, is it, just I mean, is it stuck? <laughs> I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, so even the, the idea of saying that Goya well, has been, me. the Goya has been sort of kind of like transgressed by Pritstick, that's just too much to bear. Can we go back to the... <laughs> it's just too much to bear. You can draw all over them, but as long as you're showing some skill, but if you stick Pritstick on it and a stupid yes. picture of children, or, you know. But in a sense, the, but in a sense, the thing, the game in the work, in this sense, is that, is that there's a kind of... Yeah, the, yeah. We have that. But, but, the, but, but it, what did you did you cut it? Mm. You cut it. Mm. But why did you have to cut it? What, and what but, difference if you just but what, it? but what would that mean? Are we talking about we're getting into some sort of really interesting no, idea about labour? I never thought no, you'd cut it. No, but you kind of you seem to be more upset because they're stuck on. <laughs> I mean, they're really stuck no, on. No, I'm trying to say this is brilliant because it's, I do not know any collages that work very, very in detail on Stesica. Yeah. And uh, th I've never seen a collagist yeah. do this. Which, no. So they, and, I, and this is because it's your signature yeah. thing, which is copying. Well, you know, the only thing, I mean, I, this, I am going to... I'm going to fall into anecdotal storytelling here because it's, it's funny. Let's right? let's it's go. funny. It's just funny. I, I'm not going to apologise for it. But I mean, you know, putting glitters on Goya's, whatever. You know, sticking pictures on. I didn't like but when we had the when we had the Hitler paintings, we had Hitlers in a box. Yeah, yeah. We bought these Hitlers, and they sat in a box. The box glowed for about six months. It was like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> we, we didn't have the guts even to take them out of the box because it was so like, oh, I don't, it's like, oh, it's a great idea of drawing on Hitlers. Yeah, but oh, I don't want to take them out. I don't even want to touch them. Anyway, came the day when we were very, you know, kind of brave one day. We got them out. And... Um, I remember, you know, kind of, you know, the, the thing is the same thing. Like working out what would be the most insulting thing. We have got this great book, this amazing book, called Hitler, the Unknown Artist. 
which, you know, I mean, Hitler, the well-known genocider, but the unknown, unknown artist, you know. So anyway, the, the, you know, so, 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 so we had these, these kind of Hitler watercolors, you know, putatively, ostensibly, you know, some of them must be fake, some of them must be real. Also, actually, what's interesting is that we had these um, provenance letters from people saying, you know, I first got this, this, this painting from this Hitler original from my dentist's pet dog sister's wife's husband. So these kind of extracted sort of, that you can never, anyway, so when we sat down to paint these things, I remember I started the first one. I have to say that Dinos was a little bit more squeamish about it, you know. And um, so we were kind of like, what would be the worst thing? What would, what would be the worst thing for Adolf? What could we do that would be the most awful thing? It's like, I think maybe rainbows. I think rainbows. So, so if anyone's ever done watercolors, you know, this is kind of extended anecdote. But you know, when you do when you do when you do watercolors, you tend to do this. You know, you tend to use the brush and then you dip. You know, you use the paint and you have this. this, this if you've done watercolors for any amount of time, you, there's this kind of little artistic tick that you have where you point the brush with your mouth just so you get a nice line. So, I'm doing this thing, drawing these water this kind of rainbow, colouring it in, pointing the brush, and Dinos said, do you think that when Hitler did that watercolour, <laughs> he pointed it with his mouth? <laughs> I said, like, Copy your game. So, do you think I've got a little bit of Hitler DNA in my mouth? <laughs> anyway, it's just a thought. <laughs> I heard you. OK, so I can't resist, and it's got nothing to do with anything, but I would like to know what you think of Francis Bacon's work. Um, I just can't help thinking of Freud, eggs, and bacon. Um, okay, that's your uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have, uh, I think there's, yeah, there's Why isn't there an artist minutes? called Eggs? It would be brilliant, wouldn't it? You could have a show called Freud, eggs, and bacon. It would be brilliant. Could we have Sorry. questions from the audience, please? No, obviously not. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in the relation between redemption and redeemability. Because mm. if you do these things uh, on a, a, a reproduction, yeah. especially digital these days, you can redeem anything. Yeah. You could just you know, press reverse yeah. and it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly you've done something which is irreversible mm -hmm. and unredeemable. Mm. Um, at the same time, some, somewhere around in the background is the larger meaning of redemption and irredemption. Mm -hmm. and I wondered if you could enlighten that. Um, um, no. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think... I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I guess the idea of sort of rewriting Brett Easton Ellis's book from the point of view of a woman, you know, or, or working on Goya's work is, is you know, it, is, is that it's kind of echoed by the idea of me and Dion's working together. You know, the idea of two people making one person's work is that it already, it already pushes the work into a, a, an area of kind of untrustworthiness, you know, because, you know, for, an, for the, the kind of, the kind of the, the, I guess the conventional notion of an artist is that, that, that they do something which um, can be treated as though it's trustworthy because it's a thing which has no reason to lie and it's a thing which has a kind of a slightly confessional element in terms of the fact that the kind of transaction between the person who looks at it and the person who makes it is that you trust that they're not... <coughs> They're not lying. God, I'm, now I'm choking. <laughs> That's quite weird. <laughs> I know, it's a symptom. <laughs> so the idea of working on someone else's work, I guess it just extends that notion that... Um... <laughs> Can I, can I just say Heimlich something? Heimlich maneuver, I think. It's, it's <laughs> can I drink your water? Sorry. Uh, you your I've drunk it. I've been talking more than you. Thank you. Where am I looking for me? Oh, sorry. Um, one of the things that um, 
I think of, uh, again, in relation to your Goya work, uh, I think of Freud's Rat Man. Yeah. And the Rat Man came to Freud and told him a story of, of torture, uh, which is a, a, a rat torture, have I got his name? Uh, the rats are put up uh, the anus as, as, yeah. as torture. Yeah. And what Freud described yeah. was, and, and the, you know, this, it, he was, the rat man was horrified when he stopped saying this, but Freud uh, discerned a look on his face that was one of enjoyment. So it's like a, a hidden enjoyment. In a sense, mm -hmm. what you're bringing out yeah. is, is that enjoyment, and you're bringing it out, and yeah. you're, you're the, yeah. the husk is, yeah. you know, you, you... Well, that's, that's really true, because I think if you look at um, how easily it is to um, sort of separate yourself from the experience of the work is by calling it shocking. When you call something shocking, you kind of sever any kind of engagement with the work yes. by saying that it's no, mean, that, no longer anything to do with me. That's the that you want to get yeah. rid of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nothing yeah. to do with me, with me because my experience of it is that I'm rejecting it by saying it's this, you know. But actually, in a sense, you know, shocking is is a, is a, is a kind of a libidinal, a libidinal um, symptom. You know, it's a symptom of kind of pleasure. Of course it is. Yes, is there a mic here? I was just kind of curious uh, how you felt when you and your brother were somehow working on your own work. Mm. We, um, we were talking about this last night uh, when the Saatchi storage facility f basically burned mm -hmm. and you guys had to recreate basically your hell pieces. Mm. And in some way, at the same time, it kind of reminded me a little bit and in conversation we were talking about uh, Baldessari's Right. Idea of you know burning his his paintings and as a kind of conceptual yeah. as a way to sort of almost liberate this kind of conceptual art and even when Pravin is talking about uh, collage even Baldassare's idea of putting dots on, on yeah. things and sort of subverting these things I'm kind of curious how you guys. Uh, basically thought about that reconstruction aspect because very different from a lot of the other work on working somebody else's thing. Yeah, I mean, we were very happy when we heard about the fire. <laughs> Only because we thought it was just Damien and Tracy and everyone else. And, <laughs> and then someone phoned up and said we actually had the biggest piece in there, which is not so funny. It was like, yeah. So it was, it was a work that took two and a half years to make. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I mean, you know, the, the, the thing about this is that, you know, it's, you know, we had people phoning up saying, is it true that hell's on fire? You know, you couldn't not then re harvest <laughs> this whole thing and think this is hilarious. You know, of course, you know, journalists, you know, is it true that hell's on fire? Yes, I, mean, I think so. I think it's always been on fire. You know, you couldn't not see that as being a kind of a, a, a you know, the, the, the work when it existed was a very, you know, problematic work in terms of where it was shown and stuff. So it didn't, it didn't exist in any kind of positivized way, you know. And in, in actual fact, what you could notice is that once it was burned, people had much more affection for it. You know, people mourned its loss, and it was once it was turned to kind of dust, it was like, oh, you know. But then you rebuilt it. Yeah, we made two more. <laughs> but also one of the things that we did is we also, we, you know, we had this idea, you know, we had this idea of thinking, well, you know, um, you know, this idea of sort of thinking that, you know, making art is a kind of a, a, a sort of a, you know, failed, you know, but that, that kind of, it's kind of failed, but it doesn't. It's not. It's not heading towards some notion of perfection in our in our case. Mm -hmm. But the idea of sort of the work burning was that, you know, pragmatically, <laughs> it was upsetting because that thing didn't exist anymore. But the uh, but the but the um, but the wealth of stuff that came from it that was you couldn't fail to see that was not was also kind of worthwhile. Was also actually became part of the work. You know, it was really you could really see that as being kind of actually quite uh, a way of actually. You know, that the idea that actually what you could do is you could repudiate 
the sadness that you, you were expected to feel by your work burning and then say, we'll just make another one. Because there's nothing more sort of um, blasphemous than, than, than piggybacking the sense of sort of sentimentalism that you'd feel if your work was burned, you know, sobbing and going, oh, I can never do it again. We just instantly said, we'll just do another one. You know, and so in some senses, what that did is that reinforced the notion of making the work that the work wasn't kind of organized out of some kind of, you know, tricky, emotional, you know, yeah. And also, actually, you know, we, we had this idea of saying that what we would also do is we'd, we would remake every other work of art that was burnt. We remade Trace's Tent, and then we just got bored of it, and we couldn't be bothered with doing it anymore. So. But we still have Trace's Tent, which is really kind of, it's quite good. I tried to give, we tried to give it to the Tate, you know, but they wouldn't take it. They were too scared of Tracy. Honestly, I honestly, it was true, you know that. Yeah, we actually offered to, we, I threatened to put it in a Luton van and take it and dump it on their front lawn. But they, <laughs> it's like, I want yeah. to ask you about a rather cruel thing you did mm. called Ubermensch. I don't think it's, it's cruel. It's a f four foot. Eight inches. I think it's in one of the hell vitrines, is it? Oh, he's, 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 there's a lot. Uh, no, but we did the big, massive sculpture with him on the kind of like the monocle. Yeah, about to fall off a cliff. Not really. With his computer and his. Well, and you, I don't wheelchair. think he was falling. I think he was, he was kind of. He what, was, just, what, how did he get there? Because he was, um, he was an inappropriate subject. You know, he was a completely inappropriate subject. And, you know, the idea of sort of, you know, kind of, you know, this notion of saying that, you know, Ubermensch, this kind of Superman, yes, well, so. you know, you're confronted with this idea of saying, well, A, he's an inappropriate subject, but also B, he's been presented as this kind of, you know, Superman, you know, Superman because actually, you know, you know Nietzsche has that great thing, is just that it's not, it's no longer the survival of the fit, fit, fittest, it's the survival of the weakest. What determines civilization is not fitness, it's weakness. Well, I Which is a kind of a fantastic idea. It's a brilliant idea. That's not, I mean, that, you know, poor old Nietzsche is misaligned by, you know, this notion that what he presents is the idea of the overman as being something better than human. He's just saying that it's something beyond human, not better. There's no kind of, you know, there's no fascism involved in it whatsoever. You know. Um, Was Nietzsche in your mind when you did it? Not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mark. Go on. I mean, I, I was thinking, um, I mean, some of the issues turn the other way around, have a, not surprisingly, a kind of religious source. Mm. Um, I'm thinking particularly, I mean, it seems to be one of the cruelest and at the same time funniest yeah. uh, statements by, you know, like St. Augustine is by. Mm -hmm. Someone says, you know, will the body be alive? in hell. Yeah. And he kind of says, yeah, but you know, it's going to be slightly kind of different. Yeah. The body in hell is going to be slightly different in the following way. You can't faint, you can't lose consciousness, <laughs> and you can never die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, when you think about someone actually seriously proposing, like, mm. let, let me have a think about mm. it. I want to give a kind of accurate answer on this hell business. Mm. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, in a funny way, he's right. I mean, um, in a sense, our notion of death and whatever is culled from a life which, however terrible, can at least end. Yeah. Um, the thought of putting one in, one that just can't. Yeah where kind of immortality yeah. is just the most vile thing in the world, mm. or just outside the world. Um, I think obscurely, I mean, it also kind of touches on the question of like what the difference between a joke and uh, laughter is, because I think that people as, Bobby points out, obviously enjoy catastrophic events, even though it's very soon repressed mm. or, you know, children are told not to look at it or whatever. Mm. I mean, I seem to remember, like, the 50s, 
There was an entire period when you were in the car of being told not to look outside because there's been an accident. Why you weren't allowed to, you know, you just thought, why can't we park and just go and see it kind of normally? Yeah. Um, but the, there is here, it, it, there's like a, a very discreet difference between a joke and laughter. Yeah. But, uh, but isn't there that joke, isn't there? The, the, the joke, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Which is not funny. But why did the chicken kill itself to get to the other side? Which is funny. Yes. Mm -hmm. So one involves pain and death, and one just involves a chicken. <laughs> 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 I think I've answered that Is question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how it fits in. There used to be a time in the 80s where Slavoj Žižek yeah. had the image of this man who was terrified he was going to be eaten by a chicken. <laughs> so it's just the kind of fear he would have. Um, and checks himself into a hospital, and they say, after a fortnight, we think you're cured and you can go out. Uh, he said, what do you feel about chickens? He said, I no longer fear that they're coming to eat me. And so the doctor said, so everything's all right? And he says, not quite. Has anyone told the chickens? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, last question. The last question. Right in the back. Yes, yes, I have the microphone. Um, have you ever, or do you ever have in mind when you're working that perhaps some future generation may also take your work and then build upon it in the what? same way that do you, you mean draw on it? Yeah, exactly. The the Pritt stick I'm of the 23rd century. Uh, no, I just wondered if you'd yeah. ever reflected on this about what the future life of your works might be, or if they may be treated in the same way, and, and if so, how that might make you feel. Um, I mean, I do. Um, well, I've always, I've always kind of looked at the mannequin, mannequin sculptures, for example, thinking that um, you know maybe in the future that you know there'll be a kind of an inversion of what's what's kind of um, valuable about it. That in some ways, what will happen is that they'll get the sculptures in the you know hundred years time, chuck the sculptures away, and they'll have the sneakers. And they'll be like, look, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> look at these things. You know, um, I don't know really. I, I, uh, so kind of, you know, I don't really. I, it's kind of, it's a horrible thought. It's like someone else looking through your slaps, uh, holiday snaps or something. You know, I don't. Um, you know, we used to do this thing. I guess you know. I mean, it's kind of probably more than I should admit to. But when we made some sculptures before, we, we had this idea of saying, God, you know, what about the idea of the future? What would happen if? Um, I think I had to go and go to the Tate once when they had something, and they went through this. They had this pencil, and they, they there's someone in a kind of a white suit, and they kind of pointed to everything thing and said, How is that made? How is that made? And I said, Mostly super glue. At which point they just winced at every, you know, because obviously that, you know, at a certain point, maybe 20, 23, everything we've ever made, in, in, which has like with super glue in it, there's going to be this kind of like sudden like defoliation event where everything's just going to go. Like that, and there's not going to be any work left. Um, um, but what we used to do was <laughs> no, that we used to. Um, no, I'm not going to tell you that's too. No, uh, no. So, so future work, I don't know really. I mean, you know, they, they, I mean, I don't really think that arts. I had this idea of thinking that you know that if in the future there was a kind of you know because we're kind of obviously now we haven't mentioned the kind of mass extinction, which is kind of like the thing that we should have talked about. But imagining in you know in the near distant future there's this idea of how human culture will be sort of perceived or raked over by um, alien um, anthropologists that will come down and sort of work out what was going on with this this kind of supposedly intelligent set of people that they'd kind of they'd come across the Tate Gallery and it would be kind of burning embers and kind of bricks and whatever and they'd step over the walls and into this you know space that they would see as being some kind of sacred kind of area in which these rituals would have occurred and they would look at them and think wow you know what are these people you know obviously art must have been this thing that they venerated above everything else this thing that they poured money in and they had this value and they'll look for it and they won't be able to find it in this gallery and what they'll be doing is they'll be stepping over Carl andre brickworks without noticing that that's actually not part of the building. You know, uh, that's, that's, my, that's my image for the future. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. 
Good. Well, Good. despite your attempts to sabotage the evening, <laughs> I hope everyone has enjoyed I think I've been very generous with my time. Thank you. I mean, I drove in from yeah. Gloucestershire, for God's sakes. <laughs>